Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind and uh, properly enunciated uh, introduction. Um, my name is Prithvi Mrithian Jaya, and I'm uh, welcoming you here. It's kind of early in the morning in um, Northern California. I wanted to first thank the organizers for putting on this wonderful, unique, um, exciting format of a virtual meeting. Uh, it's the most unique that I've seen uh, since we've had this COVID um, situation. So first off, I hope everyone's in good health. Uh, say enough about um, uh, Melanie and her team and just everything they've done uh, for this community of patients and physicians and researchers and family members. So hats off to you, my dear, for uh, all you continue to do. A special hello to all of um, our patients and their families on the West Coast who have woken up a little early to uh, join this nationwide family. Um, but a specific and special hello to all of our patients from Stanford that uh, have uh, joined this uh, presentation and also are on the journey with us. So without further ado, um, we've split up this session amongst the three of us to be able to um, kind of share all that we're doing here. So let me get going with our presentation. Here this morning. So I'm just going to adjust this a little bit. Okay, so I think you can see my screen. If there's any issues, somebody just shout out to me so we're talking about what's new in ocular melanoma um, and i'll be focusing on some specific topics so um, as acknowledgements i'm a consultant to both castle biosciences and aura biosciences um, but i have um, my talk does not refer to any of those um, uh, entities specifically I wanted to think back to um, our uh, events that we've had with Acure Insight back from my days at Duke University, but also um, since I've come here to Stanford, the um, ACIS community has really embraced our uh, program here, and we've been able to put together um, several of the 5K events here at Stanford University and at the Byers Eye Institute, um, and uh, most importantly, my good friend um, who helps to support so many uh, in their journeys. Uh, we hope to get back on the road and racing again soon. So what we're talking about is kind of the complexity between um, the patient, the disease, diagnosis, um, how we put all that together in terms of um, moving the needle forward for our patients. And I think personalized cancer therapy is something very exciting. And the talks that we just heard from Dr. Harbour really are at the cutting edge of this, where we use information to make treatment decisions that are customized for our patients. And I think this is part of the pipeline of evolution that we're working on. So we're not exactly there yet to drive therapies, but a lot of exciting work is on the way. But part of it also in doing so is identifying patient populations that are at high risk, identifying them, following them, and then uh, being able to then put them into different locations for studies and definitive therapies. So if I take three patients um, that each have a medium-sized ocular melanoma, and they were all treated the same way with radiation therapy, um, and they may all have the same uh, genetic composition, how do we follow these patients? What do we tell the patients uh, they should do for follow-up to return to see us in the clinic? But also a question that comes up is, what about getting testing to look for disease outside of the eye? We call that systemic surveillance or metastatic screening. There are different types of surveillance strategies that are used. And to be honest and clear, there are no one gold standard, but there are some techniques that may have some very strong evidence to be superior to others. Um, the purpose is to detect metastatic disease or spread of the cancer to other parts of the body at the very earliest stage. Now, I hope nobody develops metastatic disease, but we know this is a tricky 
condition and um, we need to be able to identify so that then we can direct our therapies, which you'll hear more about today. Um, the, the predominance is the use of radiographic techniques where you go to the uh, radiology center, outpatient imaging center or the hospital. We used to rely on blood tests, but we found that they're probably not as accurate or helpful as radiographic tests. So some centers still may get a liver function panel, but we've, for example, moved away from that and many others just because it may not give us the earliest detection. And there's still no OM blood test that will tell us whether someone has um, OM or not in the blood that's been fully validated. We can do ultrasounds of the liver. We can get chest x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, or PET scans, or a combination of them all. And a lot of this depends on uh, the patient's physical condition, any um, allergies they have to contrast dyes, the um, kind of the body habitus of a patient that would allow certain techniques to take place, the risk level of the patient, um, and then also what the, um, I guess, the, uh, the pre-test probability that there will be, um, that you want to catch something as quickly as you can. So sometimes um, these techniques will have a greater ability to detect a much smaller disease burden than not. But what I tell people is CAT scans, MRIs, PET scans, these days are all really pretty much state of the art. And the, there are some subtle slicing and dicing that you can do to say which one's better or not, the uh, excess exposure to radiation uh, or not, uh, cost or not, all these things factor in, but they're all pretty darn good. We know that liver ultrasound and chest x-ray um, have been uh, validated in many studies, but in terms of the technical detail, may not be up to the par of those other tests. But again, it's an individualized decision. So it comes to what's new. So the National Comprehensive Cancer Network is a, a very important um, academic uh, and private practice-based uh, medical group that is comprised um, of recommendations for the prevention, diagnosis, and management of cancers across the continuum of care, from early diagnosis to testing that needs to be done to treatments to what happens afterwards. And they have put together these panels that really apply to more than 97% of patients who are living in cancer in the United States. The NCCN is a big deal. Um, it helps to influence the standard of care across the industry for screening, treatment, and follow-up. Most importantly, it's followed by payers and by the CMS who makes the decisions about who covers these tests and these procedures from an insurance standpoint. And the impact of this is great. So if there's a treatment that needs to be performed and your insurance company comes back and says, we're going to reject it, if we can pull up the NCCN guidelines, most likely it changes their mind. And it equalizes the landscape for our patients. So no matter where you are in the country, um, you can look at what is considered to be generalized standard of care. They base their recommendations on levels of evidence so um, they look at category one, category two, category three, and we obviously want high level evidence to make these recommendations. We are very fortunate that the uh, most recent guidelines um, that were published in 2019 are currently being updated. And we are really lucky that not only do we have great medical oncologists, we actually have two prominent ocular oncologists who um, are meeting our patients you know, from the first time they come into their clinic and Dr. Uh, P. Kumar Rao from Washington University in St. Louis, who's the chair of this subcommittee, and also my good friend Miguel Matarin uh, at Duke um, Eye Center and the Duke Cancer Institute. So they're representing um, what's happening on the ground. So you can look these up. These are available online. They give a lot of detail, but I'll show you a couple of uh, key slides here. First is the NCCN guidelines on workup and treatment and how that can be performed. They are broad, so there's not like this is the only way to do it, but it does give a lot of latitude for clinicians to do what they do best. But it also gives um, patients and, um, and family members a, a general sense of, are, is this how my family member or I should be treated 
um, based on their presentation. So all of these have a whole bunch of kind of subcategorizations uh, to bring in good um, detail, but uh, this, for example, looks at the size of the tumor and the treatments that may be recommended um, and can be followed. What I thought was most um, compelling was a screening protocol for after the patient is treated or diagnosed with melanoma to look for distant metastases. And what they've done is divided patients based on genetic risk and uh, tumor size in terms of having a low, a medium, or a high risk of metastasis. And we know this by different words, class one, class two, uh, prime positive, prime negative, different stages. And then they offer kind of a guideline for the timing of screening. So that allows us to say we are going from a, um, a lower risk lesion that may not require as active a screening protocol to a high risk lesion that really is recommended to get screened more frequently. And again, the decision will be a local one between you and your doctor and you and your oncologist um, and how you feel about it, but this does provide a framework for, um, for what we're doing. So just as a caveat to end, you know, when we looked at these original um, guidelines, we were very impressed, but we weren't satisfied um, with just the clarity because it used uh, different levels of evidence and we weren't satisfied that pathology or just looking at a specimen under a microscope uh, guided a lot of their decision making. Um, and it wasn't just based on the most recent science or genetics. So uh, I've been fortunate to be part of the Collaborative Ocular Oncology Group uh, study part two, which is a multi-center NIH funded study headed by Dr. Harbour, who you just heard. Um, and we are one of the centers for this on the West Coast. Um, and this group, um, and the leadership committee, um, headed by Dr. Harbour, Dr. Correa, Dr. Marr, all who you'll hear uh, today, uh, Amy Scheffler from Texas, and Dr. Auberg um, from Michigan, and myself, we worked with the NCCN to bring out these points, and they were very receptive and very open, and um, have been looking to use the highest level of evidence to uh, guide our patients' uh, recommendations going and forward. And we feel confident that the 2020 revisions, which I'm happy to present to you next year, um, will reflect this. So why is this good for um, UM patients? It brings a voice to the table for um, melanoma ocular oncologists, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists. It incorporates evolving science into these recommendations. And most importantly, it equalizes the playing field for patients across the U.S. in terms of uh, their voice and their ability um, to work with insurers and policymakers. Thank you very much for your time and for inviting me for this conference. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. There we go. There's Brianna. Oh, give me just a moment. This is a, uh, a game of rock, paper, scissors to see who goes first. You guys ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> do the presentation. Dr. Amin, we'll have you come up right after Dr. Marr. Okay. Good. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. And I have the honor, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that Prithi does a great talk and that it's really important that this information get out to the, the world in a formal way so everyone can uh, see the importance of ocular melanoma. Uh, I'm in charge of talking to you about a new drug for treatment of primary uh, uveal melanoma. It's the AU0111, and it's a targeted therapy for small melanomas. And we have concluded uh, a portion of the phase 1b open label trial. And I'd like to um, kind of give credit to all my co-authors that are involved in that uh, listed below. Um, I am a, oh, all right. Let me see, I'm black. Hold on one second. All right. Mm. 
Let me try it one more time here. Dr. Mara, I have your slides up here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, a screen here. So if you'll take the share Brianna, screen. you want to switch over and, and troubleshoot this really quick? Yeah. Give me just a moment. Mark, can you see the, your screen? Can you take your, your share screen off so you've got your slides up? Say that one more time. Taylor has your slides up right now. Can you see that, that she has your uh, slides up? Oh, good. Yeah, so if you'll just unshare your screen, you can just prompt her to change it. Okay. And I'm, I'm, we're live now? Excellent, Taylor. Thank you. So rewind and again uh, i'm going to have the pleasure to present to you some new therapy that's designed for treatment of primary uveal melanoma and it's uh designed by the aura company and the study is an au011 targeted therapy for small choroidal melanoma next slide And so financial disclosures, I consult for both Aura, Castle, and Immunocore. Next slide. Uh, many people, and if we, we the standard therapy, there's a lot of good options and effective options, but many of them have uh, an impact on vision. And so this company came up, next slide. With a new particle. And it's a neat story. I actually remember meeting the inventor and the um, business director of this new idea probably about 10 years ago when I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And they walked into the office and said, hey, would you be interested in, does this sound reasonable? where we have this particle that's derived from the HPV vaccine, and it's a small uh, viral-like particle used in the vaccine, and it's conjugated with a photodynamic dye, which when activated by a specific laser, causes it to release oxygen-free radicals and, and it binds directly to cancer cells. Uh, and causes destruction of the cells, and also that destruction of cells elicits an immune response. Uh, and it sounded like a really interesting and, and unique um, approach to treatment of uveal melanoma because it was designed to have really targeted therapy. Next slide. And so the way it acts is just as I described, it, it binds to the um, cancer cells and it does this by a specific mechanism, the way viruses, uh, the skin, same type of can. And this is how it uh, targets cancer cells specifically. Next slide. Can we see our next slide? Let's see what we can do here. So some of the original um, data was performed using rabbit models. And um, when we looked at the concentration of drug that was needed, 
um, about 50 micro, micrograms when injected into a rabbit eye showed a, a significant decrease in, um, in tumor borne. So the first phase one, two uh, trial was used for small tumors, 0.5 millimeters to 3.5 millimeters. And it was designed to look at the safety of the drug, the effective dosing of the drug, and any complications, and also some of the early efficacy. And that was with 57 patients. Um, over time, uh, we noticed that from a safety standpoint, it's very well tolerated with no really severe adverse effects. Most of the time, most of the time, it um, just causes symptoms of inflammation. Having trouble getting my slides up there here, sorry. One more thing. Dr. Margaret, you're up. Do you see the Remo, uh, the Remo um, window there? 